When Mother finished Scheherazade's story, I cried, But how does one learn to tell stories which please kings? Mother mumbled as if talking to herself that that was a woman's lifetime work. This reply didn't help me much, of course. But then she added that all I needed to know for the moment was that my chances of happiness would depend upon how skillful I became with words. With this knowledge, Samir and I, who had already decided to avoid upsetting the grown-ups with our unwelcomed words, thanks to the radio incident, started training ourselves. We would sit for hours, silently practicing, chewing words, and turning them seven times around their tongues, all the while watching the grown-ups to see if they were noticing anything. Scheherazade, like Fatima and the women of the harem, is powerless. The only tool she has at her disposal is language, and she uses it to liberate not only herself, but countless scores of women in her same position of powerlessness. By invoking language as a path to freedom and happiness, what do words become for Fatima? But whenever I tried to find out more about the word harem, bitter arguments ensued. You needed only to pronounce the word, and impolite remarks would start to fly. Samir and I discussed this matter, and concluded that if words were in general were dangerous, then harem in particular was explosive. Anytime someone wanted to start a war in the courtyard, all she had to do was prepare some tea, invite a few people to sit down, throw out the word harem, and wait for a half hour or so. Then poised, elegant ladies, dressed in lovely embroidered silk kafkins and pearl-studded slippers suddenly would turn into shrieking furies. Samir and I therefore decided that, as children, it was our duty to protect the adults. We would only handle the word harem with parsimony, and gather our information through discretion and observation only. One grown-up camp said that the harem was a good thing, while the other said it was bad. Grandmother Lala Mani and Chama's mother, Lala Radia, belonged to the pro-harem camp. Mother, Chama, and Aunt Habiba to the anti-harem one. Grandmother Lala Mani often got the discussion started by saying that if women were not separated from the men, society would come to a halt and work would not get done. If women were free to run about in the streets, she said, men would stop working because they would want to have fun. And unfortunately, she went on, fun did not help a society produce the food and goods it needed to survive. So, if famine were to be avoided, women had to stay in their place at home. This passage from Dreams of Trespass leads me to question about the generation gap between the grandmothers and mothers of Maranisi concerning the validity of the harem. What was the cause of the change in the opinion of harem? Was it due to education of women, different cultures, moving from religion, or something else? Aunt Habiba also said something about time and space about how harems change from one part of the world to another, and from one century to the next. The harem kept by the Abbasid Caliph Harun al-Rashid in 9th century Baghdad had nothing to do with our own. His jariyas, or slave girls, were very educated women, swallowing history and religious books as fast as they could in order to entertain him. Men of that time did not appreciate the company of illiterate, uneducated women, and you had no chance of capturing the caliph's attention if you could not dazzle him with your knowledge of science, history, and geography, not to mention jurisprudence. These subjects were the caliph's obsession, and he spent most of his free time discussing them between the two jihads, or holy wars. However, Aunt Habiba added, the Abbasid caliphs had lived a long time ago. Now our harems were filled with illiterate women, which only went to show how far we had strayed from tradition. And as for power and might, the Arab leaders were no longer conquerors. They were the conquered, crushed by the colonial armies. Back when the Jarias had been super educated, the Arab men had been on the top of the world. Now, both the men and the women were at the bottom, and the craving for education was a sign that we were emerging from our colonial humiliation. How does the book complicate ideas of tradition and modernity as harems change across time and space? And how is access to education linked to freedom for both nationalists and feminists? Once I asked Mina why she danced so smoothly while most of the other women made abrupt jerky movements, and she said that many of the women confuse liberation with agitation. Some ladies are angry with their lives, she said, and so even their dance becomes an expression of that. 
Angry women are hostages of their anger. They cannot escape it and set themselves free, which is indeed a sad fate. The worst of prisons is a self-created one. Mothers should tell little girls and boys about the importance of dreams, Aunt Habiba said. They give you a sense of direction. It is not enough to reject this courtyard. You need to have a vision of the meadows with which you want to replace it. But how, I asked Aunt Habiba, could you distinguish among all the wishes, all the cravings which besiege you, and find the one on which you ought to focus, the important dream that gave you vision? She said that little children had to be patient. The key dream would emerge and bloom within, and then, from the intense pleasure it gave you, you would know that it was the genuine little treasure which would give you direction and light.